You're listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome, everyone, to a webinar entitled A Post Row World, presented by Dr. Pat Castle and Kiki Latimer. My name is Sebastian Mafud, and I'm the director of iTest. The Institute for Theological Encounter with Science and Technology, iTest, is an association of theologians, scientists, and others committed to a Catholic worldview in which faith and science collaborate in exploring the truth. iTest explores truth theologically in the wisdom traditions of the human community and in the data studied in the sciences. iTest's mission is to foster and disseminate the Catholic position that science and faith in God are complementary paths to human fulfillment. Deacon James Di Natale, who serves as a deacon in the Holy Spirit Parish in Maryland Heights, Missouri, will offer our opening prayer. Deacon? Thank you, Sebastian. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, source of all life, Throughout the ages, you have commanded the human race to be stewards of all life, especially human life, which is created in your own divine image and likeness, and from which we derive our dignity and worth. At times in human history, man has not honored your command and even promoted just the opposite as a good, as we have seen by the destruction of human life that takes place in every abortion. We thank you for the recent overturning of Roe v. Wade, but we know that the work of bringing all people to understand and accept the dignity and worth of human life, especially in the womb, continues. We ask you for your inspiration during this webinar. Inspire us to help others see all pregnancies as gifts from God, not burdens, problems, or crises. Inspire us to find new ways and expand existing programs that help mothers both during pregnancy and after delivery and keep the fathers of these children engaged in their lives. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Sebastian. Thank you, Deacon. So in this webinar, we present two speakers on the topic of a post-Row world. Dr. Pat Castle will address social science in a post-Row world, and Kiki Latimer will address healing in a post-Row world. To begin our webinar, we present a previously recorded presentation by Dr. Pat Castle, an iTest board member. Pat is a native of Sioux Falls, currently living in Omaha. He graduated from the Air Force Academy and went on to earn a PhD in nanoanalytical chemistry from the University of Illinois. Pat is the founder of Life Runners, the world's largest pro-life team with over 19,600 teammates who wear the Remember the Unborn jerseys as a public witness in over 3,300 cities. A traveler, Pat encountered St. Padre Pio while racing the Pikes Peak Ascent and carried a Remember the Unborn flag to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. He co-founded the annual Law of Life Summit and the annual Across America Relay, the largest spanning pro-life event. He has served as a Pregnancy Help Center chairman and teaches outreach at abortion facilities. Be sure to get his team, Daily Devotions book, to be all in Christ for pro-life. This book features guest authors like Bishop Papraki, Bishop Coffey, Governor Christy Noem, Abby Johnson, Dr. Kevin Vost, and me. Before I turn it over to Pat, I'd like to share his January 23rd devotion. It's called First Baby Photo. Uh, it's in the devotionals book that Life Runners produced for the date January 23rd. 
O Lord God, what good will your gifts be if I keep on being childless? In Genesis 15, 2. When magnified, you can see that the zygote, our first cell at conception, looks like a communion host, the Eucharist, the body of Christ. The cells surrounding corona, uh, corona radiata, is like a monstrance, the holding vessel for the Eucharist. The Eucharist doesn't look like Jesus, and the zygote doesn't look like a person. However, the Eucharist is completely Jesus, and your zygote is completely you. Today's challenge, if you can't see your neighbor in the zygote, just wait a few weeks for magnification. If you can't see Jesus in the Eucharist, read John 6, 35 through 69 for magnification. Thanks, Sebastian, for that generous introduction. Uh, you truly are God first, life always, teammates forever. I am presenting uh, today from Omaha, Nebraska, one of the southernmost suburbs, Papillion, which is about 10 minutes from Leroy Carhart's abortion facility. So praise God, we're in post-Roe America. Phase one of, of three phases. Phase one is that we have brought clarity that the Roe decision was based on bad science. And now we have clarified that there's no room for abortion in our constitution based on that bad science. And of course, uh, lack of faith, lack of understanding of that we were made in God's image. And we're in transition. We're now transitioning to phase two, which is to make abortion illegal, that there is no room for such a thing, the crown jewel of Satan in America. It's un-American, it's un-Christian. And then the final phase is to make abortion unthinkable. So it's a blessing to be with you today. Uh, I, I'm going to be presenting uh, social science in a post-Roe world. For those that saw the abstract, great. We know education is about repetition. So I'm going to share it again I think for the folks that also have not seen the abstract. And it is, with the overturn of Roe, let us double down in our ministry to eliminate abortion from every community. There is no acceptable amount of abortion. Every life is a gift from God. We eliminate abortion by reaching students before abortion lies reach them and by serving abortion vulnerable mothers. Mothers from pro-life states can still travel to pro-abortion states. The longer the travel time, the better, allowing more time for mothers to encounter a life-encouraging person or message. 78% of post-abortion mothers said if they had encountered one supportive person or encouraging message, they would have chose life. And so we're going to cover this transition from bad science to really we're now in an area of social science where we're going to need to illuminate the realities of abortion. So I'm going to start with some strong statements uh, of reality and truth. And pro-life is pro-God. Pro-life is pro-science. God is pro-science. Uh, God is the creator of all things. So we have to have that perspective. We got to start with real definitions, not hijacked definitions. And so here we are today to declare that the Constitution um, did not have any room based on science for abortion. And it's not a right. And that statement that they uh, made is that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. So, you know, phase one. And I want to start by thinking about the perspectives that upheld Roe, that were not reasonable and not scientific. And so I want to start from a biology standpoint. From a bio biology standpoint, we know that science is clear that life begins at conception, fertilization. Um, we also know that it was a lie that even on 22 January 1973, that science wasn't clear. So the Supreme Court 
wrote up that their decision was largely based on the fact that it was not definitive when life began. And of course, uh, the gray haired scientists that are listening in can vouch for, we knew on 22 January, 1973, that life began at conception fertilization. It's just that those realities, you know, my background, if you saw my, uh, background is a PhD nano analytical chemist. So I did my PhD at one ten thousandth the width of a human hair, the atomic level, the nano level. And so, you know, this life is apparent. When I see a zygote, the first human cell, it's an IMAX of science and life. Um, full human genome, only thing different between our first cell, different that moment to now is time and food (laughs) you know we're we're we've been changing since that moment of conception of fertilization and we are changing right now and so you know praise god for those proper perspectives but that that decision on 22 january 1973 was really I, i won't even go as far as saying based on a misunderstanding they really were deceptions lies and so when ultrasound came around in the early 80s where the access to ultrasound then people could see you know as scientists we teach things that are unseen we believe in scientific theories based on evidence we know in the eye test community that faith and reason are complementary we know that our faith accentuates our scientific excitement and awe and the only thing it takes away from is where scientists go from wow look what god did to the sin of pride and lack of humility when they say wow look what i did um you know scientists were just greasy car mechanics figuring out how the carburetors were put together we didn't found found the the parts we didn't in a foundry you know get all the ores separated uh you know we didn't even engineer all the parts of the body we just reverse engineered we studied it discovered how god put it together and so you know to add a little humor i love that perspective of the three nobel laureate nobel laureate scientists that challenged god to a contest to put together the best human and each scientist had a pile of elements god had a pile of elements And just before the contest began, God reached over and scooped all the elements from those three Nobel laureate scientists that challenged him, looked at him and said, get your own stuff. So we have to have the perspective that it's all God's stuff. He created everything. And in that perspective is humility and also reality, truth. So from a biology standpoint, we know that Roe had it wrong. Um, And then they reinforced it in 1992 with the Casey versus Planned Parenthood decision. They upheld Roe. They had a chance to overturn. They had a chance to say, okay, ultrasound has made it pretty clear that life begins at conception, at fertilization. We can see it. We can see life. We can see that little unborn baby, boy or girl. But no, instead, in 1992, they reinforced reinforced Roe as something that people had had begun to expect, this right to be able to end the life of their own child. They didn't even refute anymore that life begins at conception, at fertilization. They just had a slightly different standard. Instead of the trimester system, they went to a viability standard. And they said that the federal government will uphold the right to abortion up until um, viability. And that viability line, of course, was a moving target when a child could survive outside the womb. And even philosophically, what broken philosophical bedrock because come on leaving a one-year-old 
outside, not cared for. They're not going to be able to take care of themselves. A, a one-year-old outside the womb. And so it's, again, just broken, faulty, uh, compromising, skewed, inaccurate, not right, not scientific, not logical, not reasonable. So Casey, of course, was also overturned with the Roe decision on 24 June 2022, praise God. Then how about philosophy from a philosophical standpoint? Because this is science and theology. We want to mix these things together. But let's take care of all the scientific perspective of a, of a post-Roe America. Well, Roe was upheld with faulty philosophy because we know philosophically First, do no harm. I mean, that comes from the Hippocrates Oath, from what medical doctors are supposed to. They're supposed to take this oath. And now we know that a lot of medical schools, they don't take the oath. Or did you know they revised the oath? Why? Because of abortion. They couldn't, in good faith, state first, do no harm when they're teaching abortions, how to do an abortion. How about political science as we move through our academics of of Roe v. Wade and the trash pile it now sits in. Political science, the, the bedrock of political science is the first duty of government is to protect the people. To imagine that on average from 22 January 1973 to 24 June 2022, on average, over a million children were dismembered or starved to death in their mother's wombs. And put that in comparison to, we've had about 650,000 combat casualties in the history of our country. So in one year, more children have died on average in their mother's wombs than all combat casualties in the history of our country. So political science, first duty of government to protect the people. We we're doing a horrible job with making abortion a right, which it's not in the Constitution, or even legal, which is our next phase to make it illegal. And finally, I save theology for last. Let's sum it up with Jeremiah 1.5, which is on my Life Runner shirt. Um, maybe the best news of the day, if you're wondering, like, hey, what's Life Runners? Well, first of all, running's optional. Life Runners is a ministry where people are willing to put on a shirt that says, remember the unborn. And I'll grab you a little mini jersey. So babies and onesies were in this or all the way up to uh, adults in nursing homes, age 101 in wheelchairs wearing the message. So running's optional, but if you're willing to put on a shirt, why? That stat I read at the top of our presentation, 78% of post-abortion women said if just one person had encouraged them or they saw an encouraging sign. So imagine them encountering someone out in the world, a little social science, that's where we're heading right now, with a message that says, remember the unborn. It really does impact them where they do exactly what the message says. It's compassionate. Compassion means to suffer with. They look at that and say, yeah, I need to remember someone other than just myself. Not to mention we know that abortion is not a solution to anything and there's no good that comes from abortion. So when they're thinking of their unborn child, they're also going to be better off because of all the consequences to themselves as well with abortion, which we're gonna go over with the social science. So we uh, have Jeremiah 1.5 on the shirt and a little refresher for everyone, uh, Jeremiah 1.5 is that God knew us even before we were in our mother's wombs. So how's that for some perspective? I save that for last because we can defend life. We can uh, speak against abortion as something that's not reasonable, not scientific from a biological standpoint, a philosophical standpoint, a political science standpoint, and a theological standpoint. So in post-row, the post-row uh, social science, I want to present some stats. And 
those stats are at liferunners.org slash facts or slash stats. And you can take a look at so many amazing insights from a social science standpoint, because now that we've made it through the bad science and the world has caught up to science, that you cannot defend the right to abortion based on the uh, wondering or not knowing when life begins. Life begins at conception, at fertilization. We're now in phase two, which is we need to work to make abortion illegal. Why? Because it kills one person, that little unborn child, and it harms that mother. And, and I'm going to make the case with social science of how it harms the mother. So here we go. Um, we've already covered that 78% stat at the top of the page there. And then we'll work our way down to these insights. How about that next stat at 79% of post-abortion mothers didn't know that there was free help? So we're in this social science that we need to help impact the, the decisions of our fellow humans as we love God and love neighbor. It's a corporal work of mercy. It's charitable to let our neighbors, to let people know that there are resources out there. It's Christian. As I said the, at the top of our presentation, abortion is unscientific un-American, un-Christian. So we need to let others know that there are resources and be part of that. James chapter 1, verse 22, be doers of the word. We know the book of James covers, hey, once you know truth, there's a responsibility in that truth. And we need to act. We need to do something with the truth. So it's good to know that 79% of post-abortion mothers didn't even know about free help. So how do we let them know? You could put on a shirt like Life Runners. Go to liferunners.org, register for our monthly updates, order a shirt or jacket. We send free black Remember the Unborn jackets to priests and bishops and sisters. So if, you know, send us a, a message on our website and we'll happily send you a free black Remember the Unborn jacket. And again, running is optional. It's just wearing your witness to help impact hearts and minds. The next stat, up to 75% no-show rate for abortion appointments when people are praying at one of the 650 abortion facilities in America. So, you know, praise God that now these abortion facilities are closing in states that had trigger laws. Seven states have already been successful at having trigger laws that were not, you know, bound up in court. And those trigger laws made abortion illegal in their states. So fantastic. There's another, you know, dozen or so states that are working at uh, really limiting abortion. And so we look at there's probably around half the states in America that will have some strong limitations on abortion, but half not only won't have strong limitations, they will celebrate abortion through all 40 weeks. States like Oregon, uh, Vermont, Massachusetts, New York, California, those states, Illinois, uh, and others that are, you know, celebrating evil. So, but going there and staying there, even people that are like, well, you know, I'm going to think through it. I know it's wrong. I'll speak up. Just your presence, a ministry of presence in front of abortion facilities, a lot of times enough. Social science where those mothers, those influencers won't even pull in the abortion facility. We've got 64% of abortion vulnerable mothers choose life when they see their unborn baby ultrasound. So that's why we want to direct them to these pregnancy health centers. Just the fact of them seeing that reality, seeing the science, if you will, that, wow, there's my baby. You know, life really does begin at conception and fertilization. Praise God. And I've got a little model here of a little 12-week-old baby. I mean, 12 weeks. Hold that little baby in your hand. You can see all the parts of that little baby. So many great stories of just going over baby facts, of the, the development. 
the development of a child. I keep a card in my wallet. And there's been moments where just to be able to share a stat, like week seven, seven weeks, buds of the baby's teeth appear. 99% of the muscles are present and brain activity is detectable. Week seven. So a poignant scientific fact, a biological fact like that, it's life-saving. Speak truth, speak up. Silence is consent. And we'll come to that now. 64% felt coerced. They perceive silence as consent. So in other words, if there's somebody in your life and you know truth, and you know that they're heading away from truth, it is merciful, it's compassionate, it's loving, it's holy to speak that truth. Share with them the reality, so, you know, the reality of abortion. Let them know that you will help them uh, with that choice of life for their child. And 78% said that's all it would have taken to have that little bit of encouragement, that little bit of truth to choose life. The next one, 45% of abortions are repeat. Wow. So how do we stop that chain of events? We intervene. We intervene with truth, with healing support. Because truly, healing support prevents repeats. Healed people don't walk into abortion facilities. Hurt people walk into abortion facilities. So loving, encouraging, reaching out, supporting, that's healing. And that also will prevent abortions. 40% of minors having had an abortion report that neither of their parents knew. So let us not assume social science, the reality of our society and how people think and the impact you know, as we've moved from that hard science, that reality, convinced, what does convince mean? To conquer. We have conquered the culture with the truth that life really begins at conception fertilization because for most people, a lot of people, seeing is believing. So that ultrasound, how do you not concede that, oh, I've been living in a lie. That's not a clump of cells. That's a little baby. So now we're living in a time where it's social science. We have to convince by way of meeting people where they're at with resources and help. Because a lot of people are, most people are driving into abortion facilities and they know they're ending the life of their child. So we can't assume that everyone knows about these resources. We can't assume that everyone's getting encouraged. We need to presume the opposite based on the reports of post-abortion women. 85% false positive for prenatal genetic screenings. 85%. That scientists listening in, non-scientists listening in, that's fascinating to think that there are couples, moms and dads, making decisions on the life of their children, unborn children, based on prenatal genetic screenings that are 85% false positive. Imagine, I mean, children should be defended in the womb and every child should have as many moments of life and time with their mother, with their parents as possible. Even children that have genetic defects. She'll even say, if you know that child is going to pass before uh, birth or soon after birth, can't you make a very solid argument that it should motivate you even defending those those last moments for that child even more. They only have this many moments. Don't let that rationalize, well, then I might as well abort the child. No, help that child have as many moments with their mother and their family, hearing them, being close to them. That's loving and charitable and compassionate for that little child made in God's image. So a lot of false compassion out in the world that we need to offset with stern love, real science, real compassion, 
And to think that Down syndrome, just as an example, those children are being aborted at a rate of 35% in the U.S., 48% in the U.K., 99% Iceland. 90% of relationships end after an abortion. How's that for social science? Just by knowing that truth, to be able to share that with a couple that thinks an abortion is going to preserve their relationship. Mm -mm. The pain of an abortion is going to end those relationships 90% of the time. And how about this stat at the bottom of that first list? 94% of post-abortion mothers regret their abortion. Even 80% will admit it that have been raped admit that the abortion they regret. Why? Because that abortion does not take away that rape. It puts gasoline on an inferno of that hurt. It's not healing to add an abortion on top of a rape. But dare I say that choosing life, even in those very not good circumstances, you still have this beautiful life. And choosing life, having something good come out of something horrible like a rape is healing so abortion is not a solution for a child conceived in rape it's going to make things dramatically worse so then um the reality of abortion as we get a few more insights as we kind of wind down this perspective of social science in a post-real world abortion is the top cause of death in america 930,000 children killed in 2020. They estimate that because of that overturning of Roe v. Wade and overturning of Casey versus Planned Parenthood, that that's going to save upwards of 130,000 children in the near term per year. So we've got a lot of work still to do. 18,000 adoptions per year for children in our two years compared to the 930,000 abortions per year. There's 1.5 million couples waiting to adopt a child. There's a two-year waiting line. These are life-saving social science perspectives to let people know that it turns like, well, if I don't abort my child, my child's going to end up in foster care. Uh-uh. Your child's going to end up in a loving home. Parents that are waiting to adopt a child. And as you continue down this, this reality of abortion, you see, wow. Um, you know, 37% of pregnancies among black women are aborted. 12% of pregnancies among white women are aborted. 19% for Hispanic women. 36% of all abortions were obtained by, by black Americans. So we need to speak that truth into those communities that it's not a solution. They're aborting their, their generations. 40% of women attended a Christian church service within the same month of their abortion. Don't assume just because someone's in a church pew that they are going to defend life. Uh, there's a lot of confusion. I started out at the very top of the presentation saying pro, pro-life is pro-God, pro-life is pro-science. So you can see the rest of these stats at liferunners.org slash stats that Last one, 0.02% of pregnancies are, quote, life of the mother cases. And today, you know, most good doctors would say with modern medicine, there just aren't circumstances where you can rationalize, certainly not justify, that ending the life of a child in a mother's womb is going to help preserve the life of a mother. And you can continue to study these, look at where the references are, And praise God that today we have made it through phase one. We've overturned Roe v. Wade uh, that was based on bad science. And now we're able to move into phase two, which is the social science. But there's solutions. Hopefully you saw lots of anecdotal solutions, insights that are truly life-saving insights. I will close with two short stories. First, that when I was at the Law of Life Summit in Chicago a few weeks ago, uh, there was a, a, a new life runner, someone who just registered at the conference named Isaac Newton. And I thought, yeah, Isaac Newton. How appropriate that we have Isaac Newton on our team. In the spirit of Isaac Newton, a truth seeker. Um, 
there's just nothing scientifically right about abortion and to have Isaac Newton on our team. Also, then uh, from a social science and that same, uh, when I was in Chicago, I was out for dinner and I had someone come up to me and say, hey, what's the deal with your shirt that says, remember the unborn? And I shared with her why I wore the shirt, which, of course, is the presentation we just shared together. And at the end of it, after hearing the truth of life beginning at conception, the truth that there are there is support out there, all the, a lot of those social science perspectives, she said, yeah, but what happens after the baby's born? And I said, oh, after the baby's born, when a mother goes to the resources that are available now, you know, over 3,000 pregnancy help centers in America compared to less than, praise God, less than 700 abortion facilities and decreasing in America. All those resources out there, there's on average a two-year relationship with mothers that accept help at those pregnancy help centers. She said, really? That was convicting to her. Because she had presumed that we only cared about the baby. And when she learned that we walk with those mothers um, through the, that unexpected pregnancy, when she learned that we had real compassion that was helpful, that was service focused, and that we walked with those mothers, you could see that it was convicting and converting. There was a conversion that happened. And, and so those conversations speak up. And if you're thinking right now, like, oh, man, I'm pro-life, I'm against abortion, go out in the world with a shirt that has a cross on it, and a dove, and remember the unborn on the back. But what did Jesus say? Jesus said, proclaim the kingdom of God. In other words, pick up your cross and follow Jesus. Heal the wounded. It's healing to speak truth. We made that case in this presentation and deliver, help deliver people from evil, deliver people from the crown jewel of Satan, abortion, the dismembering of children or starving of children in their mother's womb. Let us remember, and may our sword be a sword of, of truth. Um, and may we walk, may we walk in these truths. May we feel a sense of responsibility today to speak up and share those truths. Why? Because it matters, absolutely matters. It has been a, a blessing to spend this half hour with you. Um, I would like to close in prayer. And I'm going to share with you this closing prayer, the Life Runners Creed. You can find that at liferunners.org slash creed. As we pray in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We believe in the dignity of all human life from conception to natural death. We run as a prayer to defend children in the womb so they may be born and united with our Christian community. We run to build endurance, for the race is long, and we must keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord. We run for awareness, so our culture will view all human life as a reflection of your glory, Lord. We run for charity, to provide support for mothers and fathers tempted to abort their child, and healing support for post-abortion women, men, and families. We run to end abortion. For Christ died, so all may live. Guard us all, born and unborn, with your peace, Lord. For in you, life is victorious. We pray and run in your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Lady Guadalupe, pray for us. Saint Padre Pio, pray for us. Thank you for being all in Christ for pro-life. Thank you, Pat. And now I'm delighted to introduce our next presenter, Kiki Latimer is an author, public speaking coach, editor, and teacher of homiletics. She received her BA from the University of Rhode Island in the oral interpretation of literature, psychology, and philosophy, and her MA in moral theology from Holy Apostles College and Seminary. As an author, educator, and presenter, and executive director of a crisis pregnancy agency, she has been involved in the issue of abortion for over 30 years. She co-authored with Stephen D. Schwartz, Understanding Abortion from Mixed Feelings to Rational Thought, which is a stunning compilation of the strongest pro-choice and pro-life arguments that allows for meaningful comparisons and intelligent dialogue. 
This book gives the discerning reader an opportunity to see both sides comprehensively and move beyond emotionally charged mixed feelings to rational thought. Kiki also has a 10-hour Understanding Abortion seminar available on YouTube and on the iTest website. Check out Kiki's website at kikilatimer.com. Kiki and her husband, Jim, homeschooled all four of their children. They have 13 grandchildren, and they live in a lovely house on a small pond in Hope Valley, Rhode Island. For 25 years, she and Jim have led a Summa Theological Summa Theologica study group. With that, I give you Kiki Latimer. Kiki, take it away. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning. Well, it's good morning here in Rhode Island. I understand some of you are already in afternoon in England and probably evening some other places. But thank you for um, being here with us today. Um, I want to start by thanking Pat Castle um, for his presentation. I think he has some wonderful points. Um, I do want to point out, I know that for all of us watching this, this, um, this terribly sad issue of abortion is a religious issue. Um, but in um, this post-Roe world, which is very unchurched, um, uh, many people have no religious affiliation at all. Um, we have to remember that it's also primarily a moral issue. Um, so while it is a religious, a religious issue in some sense, um, and we certainly pray um, for it and, a, you know, and, and, and an end to it, um, it's primarily a moral issue, um, being no more a religious issue than murder or rape or theft. Um, and so when we reach out to people, especially those who want to say to us, you know, keep your rosaries off my ovaries, we want to make clear that abortion can be understood on a purely natural law level. You don't need to believe in God um, to understand that killing an unborn baby is, is wrong, is a horrible evil. Um, the famous atheist, uh, the atheist Nat Hentoff, um, who felt, who didn't believe in God, um, felt that this was the only life you get. And so to take this life away from someone, um, when it's, when it, this is it, um, is a horrible evil. And so please, you know, understand that you can reach out to people that are, have no religious affiliation and, um, and un they can understand that abortion is wrong as a moral issue. Um, so as Sebastian mentioned, I was co-author for Understanding Abortion uh, from ra ra um, Mixed Feelings to Rational Thought. And that book came out of teaching the issue of abortion at the University of Rhode Island, a secular university. Um, it was the last six weeks of an ethics class. Um, and this, so obviously we had the ability to reach out to young people and um that outreach is important in this post row world um, because of the effect that it had. And the best way to explain it is if we had 100 students, which we often did in the classroom, 10% of those students came in pro-life. And about 10% came in either extremely pro-choice or even some were pro-abortion. Um, but the 80% in the middle were what I call pro-choice by default. They were students that were just culturally pro-choice. They had no understanding of the issue. They had no real interest in the issue, um, unless it had come up for some reason in their lives. Um, but they considered themselves pro-choice. Um, and when I arrived at the University of Rhode Island in uh, 1980, I was one of those pro-choice by default people. Um, so I understood um, that reasoning. And what we did in the classroom, because it, we were able to do this because it was a secular university, was we, we presented the strongest pro-life arguments and the strongest pro-choice arguments um, and the materials available um, on both sides of the issue. And we tried very hard not to let the students know what our personal um, beliefs were. Um, so one day we would wear the pro-choice hat and the next day we would wear, wear the uh, pro-life hat and we would go back and forth between the issues um, and let the students 
figure out rationally for themselves where the truth lay. Um, I had one student that came to me at the end of one semester, and he said, I've been trying to figure out all semester whether you and Dr. Schwartz are pro-life or pro-choice. He said, and I talked to my mother about it. And my mother said that you're definitely pro-life because if you were pro-choice, you wouldn't be honest about both sides of the issue. So that was interesting. I said, your mother's a very smart woman. Um, but at the end of the semester, we would um, survey the students as to what their beliefs had been at the beginning of the semester and when we finished the abortion issue. And that's what I want to share with you that's very important. Of the 10% who were pro-life, they stayed pro-life and they became stronger pro-life um, under was able to argue their um, position much better. Um, so um, if you don't know the pro-choice arguments, learn them if you're going to be um, reaching out to people because um, otherwise you wind up in some corner that you don't know how to get out of. Of the 10% who came in strongly pro-choice or pro-abortion, about 10, about half of them um, jumped ship and certainly either became pro-life or moved in the pro-life direction. What was really exciting was the 80% in the middle. Of the 80% in the middle, half of them became pro-life. Half of them left the classroom pro-life. And the other half um, would say that they were no longer comfortable with their pro-choice position, even if they weren't ready um, to say that they were pro-life. So this was a huge, huge success rate um, with thousands of students. Um, and so I highly recommend that if you're, you're in this issue, um, you're speaking about it, that you know the issue, that you know both sides, um, and be able to clearly um, talk about that with, with young people especially. So one of the things that we often heard and that we hear all the time is um, from pro-choice people is abortion is a complicated issue. And of course, we understand, um, those of us in the pro-life, um, that it's not complicated at all. It's a baby. It's a baby. There's a little baby there. There's a person. Um, and you shouldn't kill that baby. And there's nothing complicated about that. But because the other side sees it as a complicated issue, it's very important that we put ourselves in their shoes and try to see the issue from their point of view um, so that you can start by saying, yes, I understand that you see it as complicated um, so that you have some, some meeting ground to begin with. During my last, one of my last semesters um, at URI teaching a, I shared an office with Dr. Schwartz and we had a knock on the door one day and this young woman sort of asked if she could come in and then she saw that Steve was there and she said, can he leave? <laughs> so since we had just finished the abortion issue, he jumped up and left. Um, and um, I asked her to sit down and asked her what I could do for her. And she said, um, I want you to know that you're the first person I'm telling this to, she said. I want you to know that at the beginning of the semester, I had an abortion. And she said, Kiki, it's really important for me to explain to you and have you understand that it, in my situation, the abortion was the right thing to do. And I just looked at her and I said, I understand. And I was very quiet and I started to pray inwardly. Uh, like, dear God, what does she want from me um, at this point in time? Because I didn't do a lot of post-abortive counseling. And she went on to say, she said, you know, I had met this man and he wanted to marry me. Um, and, you know, I, I was found myself pregnant. Um, she said, but he wasn't the one. He wasn't the one. He wasn't the prince. And so she said, I came to understand that in my situation, abortion was the right thing to do. And again, I simply said, I understand. And then she talked about how her mother had told her that, you know, don't ever marry someone just because you're pregnant. And so she couldn't marry him. And again, she repeated almost like a mantra, 
So in my situation, you have to understand that abortion was the right thing to do. And I simply responded again, I understand. She went on to tell me that she had always been Catholic. She had been brought up Catholic, had gone to church her whole life, um, had always been pro-life, had always thought abortion was wrong, but had come to realize that in her situation, abortion was the right thing to do. And again, I simply said, I understand. And then last of all, she said, you know, I had just gotten back to college and I'm going into a medical profession, and I want to make a difference in the world. And so a baby, this was just the wrong timing. So abortion in my situation was the right thing to do. And again, I simply responded, I understand. And then she fell silent. And the silence continued, and I prayed, and all I heard was, be silent, be silent. Do not say a word. And the silence got bigger and bigger and grew and became more and more uncomfortable, and I stayed silent, and I prayed. And I thought, why is she here? What what can I do? And again, the Lord said to me, just stay silent. And then finally, she said, I still talk to him every day. And, you know, she had mentioned the boyfriend and she had mentioned God and her relationship with both of them. And so I wasn't sure who she meant, God or the boyfriend. And it was him. And she said, oh, the baby. I still talk to him every day. And I said, What do you say to him? And she said, I tell him that I'm his mommy. I tell him that I love him. I tell him that I'm sorry. And see, there was the door. There was the door that opened for reconciliation. It took prudence and silence and humility um, to get to that moment of, I tell him I'm sorry. Um, and, And in this post real world, we're going to need to find those moments of prudence and humility, and sometimes silence, and sometimes speaking um, to help people heal from abortion and to be able to point them in the direction of reconciliation. Um, That's going to be very, very important as we try to help people heal, people who come to realize um, that the horrible mistake of the decision that they made. So I, I offer that 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 story. Um, and she did, I, I do believe she she did return both to talk to her mother and talk to her family priest and um, come back to the church. In 2010, I had the op- the opportunity to go to Princeton University. They had a life or choice conference. Um, I was very scared about going to this life or choice conference because I honestly believed since it had been put together by Peter Singer and um, some of you know, and uh, Francis Kissling, uh, head of Catholics for Choice, um, I really thought that pro-life was just going to get squashed at this conference. It was a conference of 400 people, of just about 200 pro-life people and 200 pro-choice people coming together for two days with speakers on both sides. Um, It was nerve-wracking to be there, to say the least, um, having lunch with people who performed abortions um, or who spoke highly in favor of abortion. Um, but I survived the two days, and um, what came out of that was fascinating to me. First of all, 
pro life did not get squashed. Pro life uh, just was amazing. We had speakers from Stanford University in England and just everywhere. It was it was awesome to be there. It was a great great privilege to be there. Um, but what came out of that meeting was that, except for maybe Peter Singer and Francis Kissling, almost everyone there who was pro-choice was only pro-choice for the first 20 weeks in utero, which I know is not great. But what you have to remember is that meant for the other 20 weeks of pregnancy, everyone there was pro-life. The pro-choice people were pro-life after 20 weeks. So that is a great meeting ground for all of us to remember, because if it, you're pro-life at 20 weeks on, then you can get somebody to pro-life at 19 weeks and 18 weeks, and you can move that back. So start with your common ground with people. Most people, um, the thought of abortion later in pregnancy is abhorrent to them. In the classroom, we found that most students believed that abortion was only um, possible in the first trimester. They were shocked to learn that there were second and third trimester abortions. Um, so find your common ground with people as we move forward. It's, it's so important to start with common ground. So when they say it's complicated, you can say, yes, it's complicated. But um, let's discuss the areas of it to start with where it's not complicated. Um, and move on from there. Um, finding ways to move from mixed feelings. Many people, that's their, we use that term in, on the book, mixed feelings to rational thought. They have mixed feelings. Um, and they have very little rational thought. Um, the, the young woman who came to me in the office, she had gut feelings about abortion all her life. She had heart feelings about abortion. She thought it was wrong. Um, but when push comes to shove, feelings didn't carry the day. Feelings didn't carry the day because she had no rational thought um, to carry her over her difficult situation. I want to mention that, as the Bible tells us, the children of darkness are cleverer than the children of light. And sometimes we're just not very clever. And two things that the children of darkness have managed to do is to distort two parts of language. One is they've pulled apart since Roe, human being and person. Before Roe, if you were a human being, you were a person. And if you were a person, you were a human being. Um, Pat Castle has talked a lot about the science, um, but you will run into people who are going to say, well, yes, we know that human beings begin at conception, but persons don't. And what they mean by persons now is functioning human beings. And so one of the things that's going to be important is to be aware of that distinction, that they're going to say a person is only a functioning human being, and to make it perfectly clear that a human being is a person, and that only a person can begin to function as a person. So my coffee cup will never begin to function as a person because it isn't a person. Um, only a person can begin to function as a person. And, and having that clear understanding is going to be important because um, there's a list of things out there put out originally, I believe, by Marianne Warren that says, you know, this is what is needed in order for you to be a person. Consciousness, the desire to continue as a person, um, being welcomed into the human community. All of those are parts of being a person. And, and it's going to be important that you are ready to say, but only a person can begin to have those functions. Um, so learning those arguments that so that you can't be put into a corner are going to be important as we move um, forward after uh, now that Roe is behind us. Remember that, you know, judicially Roe is over, but um, we still have a culture of death. The culture hasn't changed, um, and the culture will get changed only slowly and with our help, um, person by person, woman to woman, um, man to man, discussing these issues with people. The other terms, so that's human being and person were pulled apart. The two terms that got pulled together after Roe was unwanted pregnancy and unwanted child. And um, this became most clear to me um, around 19, 
maybe right around 1987 or so, I was asked as the executive director of problem pregnancy at the time to give a talk at a local community college in Rhode Island. And during that talk, I inadvertently mentioned that I had had a mildly unwanted pregnancy. And after the talk during, you know, coffee and donuts, this young man, probably 20, 22 year old student came up to me, literally took my hands in his and looked me in the eyes and said so sincerely, Kiki, I am so sorry that you have an unwanted child. And I managed to gasp for breath and pull my hands away from his and step back and somehow manage to squawk out the words, I don't have an unwanted child. Why would you think I have an unwanted child? I had two children at the time. And he looked at me just as startled and shocked by my reaction. And he managed, he managed to stammer out, but, but, but you said you had an unwanted pregnancy. And I said, yeah, I didn't want to be pregnant. I had just lost all my weight from my first pregnancy, and I was back in my size 8 jeans, and I was quite happy about it. And I didn't feel like being morning sick. Um, I didn't want to be pregnant. But the child was never unwanted. The child was loved from day one. Um, And so I came to realize through my own experience, through this experience with this young student, um, that women make a clear distinction between the pregnancy, which is what is happening to their body, and the child, which is in their body. They understand that difference. um, And it's important that other people know that difference and understand that difference that an unwanted pregnancy does not equal an unwanted child and and that the pro-choice side has pulled those terms together very effectively in our culture that people assume one equals the other. They are so different that in the crisis pregnancy agency, I can say that we literally heard this thousands of times. I have to have an abortion because if I carry this pregnancy to term, I will love the baby too much to ever give it up for adoption. Let me repeat that. I have to have an abortion because if I carry this pregnancy to term, I will love the baby too much to ever give it up for adoption. So women understand very clearly, I have to get rid of this before I bond to it because I know that I will love this baby. I know that. Um, So one of our jobs is to have that bonding happen as soon as possible, have that bonding happen as soon as possible, to work on helping the young woman recognize the reality of the baby, recognize him, his or her reality. Um, And I have found in the office that one of the things um, that helps with this is recognizing the material world, recognizing that we are material beings. Um, and the child can't be seen usually for early pre- abortions, early pregnancies. The child can't be seen. The child can't be felt. The child can't be heard. Um, so how do we show the reality of the child? You know, how do we work on this theology of the body to bring out the material world? And and one circumstance, um, one that I would like to share with you is a young woman who was in the office, and she was really tough. I mean, stony heart, um, closed to anything that we had to say. She got the pregnancy test, um, was pretty sure she was pregnant when she came in, um, said, I don't believe anything you say to me about abortion. I don't believe, I, you know, I don't really care about the prenatal life information you've given me. Um, she said, there's no way I'm having this. This, I'm, There's no way I'm not having an abortion. There's no way I'm having a baby nine months, nine months from now. There was no acknowledgement that there was a baby there now, just a pregnancy that needed to be gotten rid of. Um, she thanked the advisor um, for her time and was totally closed to any information 
um, just a real, real deep hardness, a very, um, you know, feminist woman who abortion was the only choice that she would consider. And the advisor, um, you know, said, okay, and thanked her for coming in and said, you know, if and when afterwards you need somebody to talk to or you need help, um, please come back. We're here for you. Um, And then just before she left, she said, I just want to give this to you. And she handed her a little stuffed animal and just put that little stuffed teddy bear doggy in her arms and let her hold it. And this young woman just sat there silent again and began to pet and caress the little stuffed animal and didn't move and then just eventually just burst into tears um, because this little material thing brought out the reality of the child. It gave her a material focus of a baby. Um, and so I, I, I offer that to you as a possibility, should you ever be in that situation, is to find a way to make the material world more present to a young woman. In the office, we found that um, abortion was almost always a choice of fear. Um, Sometimes it was a fear of losing education or losing a job opportunity. But more often than not, abortion is a choice of fear of losing a relationship, losing the loss of a husband or a boyfriend or your parents. Mom and dad will kill me. They'll never speak to me again. Um, I had one young woman who said, you don't understand my parents, she said, they will, they will disown me. And um, she said, I have to choose between the love of my child and the love of my parents. And she said, I can't lose the love of my parents. And we said, well, you know, your parents will be upset, but they'll come around. And she said, oh, no. She said, I have a sister who's 15 years older than I am that I haven't seen in over 15 years now, she got pregnant. They threw her out. Um, I've never met my niece. I've spoken with my sister twice on the phone in 15 years. Um, my parents will get rid of me. Um, and we we asked her to hold off on the abortion for a week to see if we could come up with a solution to her problem. In the end, she came back and um, one advisor said, you know, The only thing we can think of is what if your parents are sorry that they did that 15 years ago? Maybe they won't do the same thing with you. And that was just enough hope for her to ride on that she did go home and tell her parents that she was pregnant and that she was not going to have the abortion. And her parents embraced her, (laughs) thanks be to God, um, and said that they had made a mistake. Um, and they reconciled with their their older daughter after that, and the family came back together. Um, so finding ways to offer hope um, and recognizing that um, loss of relationships, you know, um, Pat Castle mentioned that 90% of relationships end after an abortion. Um, it doesn't help, um, but it's usually the fear of the loss of a relationship that leads to abortion in the first place. You know, he mentioned that many minors um, have abortions without their parents knowing about it, primarily because they're afraid their parents will hate them um, for it. I've heard that abortion is higher I mean, in Christian colleges um, because there's more fear of your parents finding out that you're having sex um, than having an abortion. So it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation. So our response of love, of letting our children know that we won't hate them if they make a mistake, of letting people know that it's important to support um, each other, support your friends if they get pregnant, support um, one another in these difficult situations. Oh, so... I know you've been listening, you listened to Pat for quite a while, you've listened to me for quite a while. I'd like to leave you um, 
with this one last story, and that's a story of some fishermen that um, I'm somewhat acquainted with. Um, they were out in their boat one morning, and uh, the oldest one, they were bringing their catch into shore. And the oldest one looked out, and he saw someone walking on the shore. And he looked, and he looked, and he said, It is the Lord. And he jumped into the water and swam to shore. And he let the other guys you know, do all the work of bringing the boat in. And when they got to shore, the fishermen had breakfast with the Lord. And then Jesus looked at Peter and he said, you know, Peter, we need to have a little chat. It was after the crucifixion and Peter hadn't done very well during that time period. He had denied the Lord three times. And so Jesus took him aside and he says, Peter, do you love me? You know, the English language only has one word for love. We love our family. We love our spouse. We love our kids. We love our dog. We love our favorite book. We use the word love, um, but other languages have several words or more for love. Uh, Latin, Greek, and Aramaic have, um, have several words for love. There's friendship love and divine love and the love for children, um, romantic love. But in English, it gets kind of all lost in translation. But Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me with an exalted, divine, heavenly, unlimited, unconditional love? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I love you with my small, puny, measly, human love. And again, Jesus says to him, Peter, do you love me with the divine, exalted, awesome, unlimited love? And again, Peter responds, Lord, you know that I love you with my small, limited human love. And then Jesus does something amazing. He comes down once again. And this time he says to Peter, Peter, do you love me with your small, puny, limited human love? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that's how I love you, with my small, limited human love. And Jesus says, that's enough. That's all that I need. Feed my sheep. Care for my lambs, tend the sheep. And he says the same to us that he will take our small, limited, puny human love and he will grow it like that mustard seed into something much bigger. So if you feel, especially in this issue, that your, your love is too small, that your abilities are too small, that it's all too puny. <laughs> remember Peter. Um, remember Jesus. Take that love. It's enough. It's enough to change the world. Your little tiny limited human love is enough to make a difference and change the world. Thank you. Thank you, Kiki. That was really uh, a powerful witness. So I'd like to remind our participants to post your questions in the chat room at the bottom of your screen. So leading this session will be Francis Etheridge, a Catholic layman and author of many books on bioethics. He is the father of 11 children, three of whom are in heaven. So with that, I turn this over to Francis. Uh, Francis, take it away. Thank you, Sebastian. And thank you, Kiki. And indeed, Pat, too. Uh, we have one to kick us off. Uh, Laurie has uh, made a comment and asked a question. So let's begin with Laurie. Thank you, Kiki. The stories of hope are very helpful in giving us pro-life leaders hope. 
I have recently found that sharing stories from the public right of ways is the most important influencer to have people witness as life runners or as prayer warriors during 40 days of life. Can you comment? Yes. <laughs> well, I, I coach storytellers. I've been very involved in the storytelling community, so I certainly know the power of story. People remember stories. I mean, Jesus used stories, um, homilists. I teach homiletics. I encourage the use of stories in homilies because we remember stories. You know, we grew up with stories. Our life stories are important. And um, the sharing of our stories, both good and bad, um, help us as the community, as the, help us be community, help us be neighbors to one another, help us share the experience of life, um, that we're not alone in the boat. Um, you know, many times someone is going through some depression or some bad situation. They think they're the only one that's ever gone through this. They're the only one whose heart has ever been broken. Um, or they're the only ones who've ever known the, the, the great joys. Um, and so it's important that we share our stories so that people don't feel alone. Um, it's also important that we share stories to say, you know, if we've made a bad choice, why it was a bad choice, so that maybe someone else won't make the same bad choice. But yes, yeah, stories are very, very important, and people remember stories. I, You know, you can remember a story you've heard years ago. You may forget an incident, but you'll remember a story. Um, so, um, I, you know... That's why I share my story of the unwanted pregnancy. You know, sometimes I'm like, oh, maybe I shouldn't share that story. But uh, I didn't want to be pregnant. I was in these great size eight genes that I probably haven't been in since. Um, so people remember stories. They're important. Um, share your stories with people. And that's one of the biggest things, that communication that keeps us from not being alone. Uh, was it C.S. Lewis that said, I read to know I'm not alone? Was that C.S. Lewis? I think it was. Um, our books, our stories um, are important. Share share your life. Lovely, thank you. Our stories also are what we give back in a sense. I mean, um, one of the children that's in heaven of mine is a child lost through abortion and the experience is humbling it's very humbling for me to acknowledge i'm the father of a child who's now in heaven but at the same time this allows me not to be on a platform not to be in a different situation to other people it allows me to be in the common ground of the forgiveness of god and the hope that that child now prays for me, prays for me, and indeed prays for us all. So the experience, however dreadful it is, actually in the hands of God, is a turning of water into wine. This is one of the wonderful gifts that God gives us. Another question we have is an organisation from Kevin, an organisation of medical ethicists, is considering not holding annual conferences in states that ban abortion. What arguments would you suggest to refute this BDS approach? Well, certainly knowing all of the arguments, as I said in, when I spoke earlier on both sides of the issue. Um, so they're thinking of not having the conference in states that ban abortions. Yeah. Well, again. hopefully, eventually, there's, they won't be able to have it in any state. <laughs> An organization of medical ethicists is considering not holding annual conferences in states that ban abortion. So a state that bans abortion is not going to have medical ethicists holding a conference. Yeah. How sad is that? Um, well, we obviously have our work, you know, we have our work cut out for us with the bioethicists as well. I mean, they're part of the culture of death, which is, which is part of the problem. Um, so we, we, you know, we have a lot of work ahead of us. You know, the, the fact that Roe has been overturned, is, as Pat Castle said, is just the very beginning 
of a, of a different form of the battle. Um, we are in a culture of death. We can't forget that. Um, whether we'll be able to overturn the culture of death is another, is another question. By the grace of God, we, we, that's what we pray for and continue to hope and continue to work for. Um, obviously it needs to start, um, at the grassroots level, but it also, you know, up top, up down and down up. Um, we need to work, you know, getting our message out to doctors and biologists and, um, you know, I mean, our colleges are turning out, you know, atheistic pro-death, um, graduates on, in all the sciences. Um, so we have to be aware that, you know, there, that's going to happen. And we have to continue to fight it on a lot of different levels, depending on what we are called to do personally. One of the uh, women who contributed to a book, Mary and Bioethics, an exploration, she worked in the IVF industry and she then became pregnant herself. And the realization of becoming pregnant and of this uh, child being present within her, called her to leave the IVN industry that she worked in, the in vitro fertilization industry. So in a very concrete way, it came home to this particular woman um, that she was carrying a baby and that she was working in an organization which was, if you like, making babies products. So it was very concrete, this realization. Now, one of the things that's come across in your presentation is how to make that perception of, if you like, if it begins with being pregnant, how to make that perception from very early on a perception of the presence of a child. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I think it's, 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 diff it's easier once certainly a woman can feel the baby kicking around, you know, 14 to 16 weeks. Um, but earlier, I think it's very difficult. Um, and, and that's why the use of, you know, little stuffed animals. Um, I've had other crisis pregnancy agencies say that if you can get a young woman, a woman to, um, name the baby, that the power of naming the child, um, is, then the child will not be aborted because it's, it's such a powerful thing. But I, I think it's very difficult. I think um, certainly ultrasounds help the ability to be able to see <laughs> this little guy in there um, kicking around, sucking his, his or her thumb. Um, things like that are very important. Um, but, you know, there's, there's the rational and then there's the heart, you know, and um, reaching the heart, you know, it, it's one person at a time. Um, when I was pregnant, I carried baby clothes around with me wherever I went, little tiny onesies, um, because I found it very, very difficult um, to know that the baby, I mean, I knew it intellectually, but in my heart, I found it hard on an emotional level to um, understand that there was a baby in there. I remember when the first one was born, my, the first thing out of my mouth was, oh my God, it's really a baby, which <laughs> sounds ridiculous. Um, but because intellectually, of course it's a baby. Um, but there was some level of my being that found it such a miracle, such a fascinating, crazy miracle that there was another person inside of me, um, so I've always understood that that disconnect that can happen um, and, and trying to find loving, caring ways to bridge that disconnect um, one person at a time. But I do understand it. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. We have um, another invitation to comment. Um, about 30 years ago, I was watching... Sorry, from Max. About 30 years ago, I was watching a rabbinical council discussing abortion, and they said that if the physical life of the mother was involved and abortion was permitted, what about her mental state? Say a woman in a rape, a white woman and a black man, and she did not want the baby nor for it to be adopted. Her mental state was in jeopardy. What part does that consideration play? We actually had a young woman who um, came to our um, 
pregnancy agency many years ago, and she had been raped. Um, and she was engaged to be married, and um, she had she decided that if it was the child of the rapist she would give the baby up for adoption. And if it was her boyfriend's child, um, obviously they would keep the baby. Um, it was a very painful, painful situation for those nine months. Um, thanks be to God, it, it was the child, her, her fiance's child. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, mental health certainly matters, um, but we don't kill people because of your mental health. I mean, that's what it could, that they, there we, you know, the reality of the, once you understand and recognize the reality of the child in the womb, um, that this is another person, um, certainly your life, your life as the mother matters and your mental health matters, but we simply don't kill people. Um, the bottom line is we don't kill people because of your health, be it your physical health or your mental health. We can possibly sometimes remove people move them farther away from you. So like with an ectopic pregnancy, we can remove the baby with no intentions of killing it. And once the technology is better um, of, of allowing it to live, um, we certainly, um, in a case of cancer, or the mother has cancer, trying to take the baby out as soon as, as, as possible to try to save both lives. Um, but the bottom line is we don't kill people to... <laughs> help other people. So if my neighbor is driving me nuts and is disturbing my mental health, I can't go over and kill him. Um, it's a sad situation if my neighbor is causing me um, mental health issues, um, but I still can't go over and kill him. Um, and, and the child is, is the neighbor. The child in, is, is the neighbor. Um, and so recognizing his or her humanity um, and his right, his or her right to life, regardless of my mental state. Sometimes that's difficult. Sometimes you'd like to go over and kill your neighbor, but you know that's just not a choice that anyone gets to have. Okay, thank you. Um, one of the statistics that came out in Pat's presentation is seventy-eight percent. Uh, said that if only one person had shown a sign or in some way made concrete the support that is possible for a woman in a difficult situation. So on the one hand, there is this incredible dearth of publicity of these 3,000 uh, pregnancy centres, 3,000 places where women can seek help. So this is on the one hand. On the other hand, in this... Um, culture of death, what will foster a sense of relationship which is more widespread so that actually it becomes unthinkable that I can confess I'm pregnant, I can be confident of sharing this news. Um, so would you like to comment on those? It's a good question. Of the situation? It will take time. Um, it will take speaking about abortion and speaking about, you know, things that are available. And it will, you know, it's, it's a matter of changing hearts. It really is a matter of changing hearts um, about the issue so that it becomes unthinkable. Um, I, you know, I know there's a lot of resources out there for pregnant women, and I certainly, I'm, I'm involved in those resources, and I certainly know that they're important. Um, but I have never in all my almost 40 years now of dealing with the issue. I have never had a woman say, I'm having an abortion because I don't think I can get baby supplies, or I'm having an abortion because I don't think I have money for diapers, or I'm having an abortion because I'm not sure I can afford an apartment, um, or I'm having an abortion because I don't have enough money. That's not why the resources, believe it or not, at least in my experience with thousands of women, is that those are not the reasons primarily that women get abortion. They get abortion because they're out of, not fear of resources, but fear of losing a relationship or a lifestyle. Um, and so knowing that there's support um, is the important thing. Um, knowing that there's support, knowing that there's people that care 
um, that will see you through this. Um, that's that your boyfriend isn't going to leave you or your husband's not going to walk out or your parents aren't going to hate you. Like telling our kids, if you get pregnant, come home, I'll still love you is really, really important. Um, my own experience of, uh, you know, I, I used to keep pregnancy tests at home in case someone didn't want to go to the office. They wanted me to meet them somewhere. And my daughter came home. Um, and, uh, She'd been living with her boyfriend and she came home and she said, mom, I think, you know, I might be pregnant. And I was like, nah. I said, do you have any symptoms of pregnancy? And she said, no, she lied. (laughs) I said, well, you know, go pee in a cup and I'll go just do a test for you quickly. And, you know, I was in complete denial. Of course, this test will be negative. I have her permission to share this story. And, um, So she went upstairs to work on the computer and I went to the bathroom to do the test for her. And, um, and, um, there I was with this positive test and I headed for the stairs. And as she came down the stairs, our eyes met and she sort of just collapsed on the steps. And the first thing out of her mouth was somebody please throw me down the stairs. And, and those are the words of an unwanted pregnancy. And um, there's a lot of things that could have happened in that moment. Um, I could have looked up at my daughter and said, you know, like, what what the hell were you thinking? How could you do this to your family? You know, you're a good Catholic girl. And, you know, here you are living with your boyfriend and now you're pregnant and you've disappointed all of us. And when her father got the message, he could have said what a disappointment she was. And her brothers could have said how embarrassed they were. And her sister and her friends could have just looked the other way. And even if she had carried that pregnancy to term, it just would have been miserable, just a miserable situation. Um, but instead, what really happened was I ran up the, do- the stairs and I just threw my arms around her and I said, don't say one more bad thing that the baby might hear. You're talking about my grandchild and I love you. And then when we called her father, he said, I love you. We'll see you through this. And her boyfriend said, I will support you and we'll see how this works out, but I'm with you. And her sister said, oh my gosh, I'm going to be an auntie. And her brother's just, just, threw their arms around her and loved her. And um, and that baby, who is my oldest grandson, is the joy of our lives. <laughs> and in a situation that could have been extremely just miserable and difficult, and within an hour of my daughter saying, someone please throw me down the stairs, um, our whole family was just dancing for joy because a child, a child had come into the midst of us. And you always, always, always celebrate a baby. You always celebrate a baby, no matter what the circumstances are. Um, And we need to let our young people know that. We need to let our daughters know that. We need to let people know that you celebrate a baby, even if the circumstances are really crummy. Um, You celebrate life. You celebrate personhood. Um, we need to we need to get that message of joy out. Um, so yeah, you can have an unwanted pregnancy, but there's never an unwanted child. Lovely. Um, before proceeding to the next few questions and points, um, on that basis, is there something that can be done more to broadcast, if you like, even if there is problems in a family? Um, that there could be a welcoming community. Now, it could be that it's the parish. It could be it's uh, some other form of uh, community presence. You know, is there a way of broadening the sense of people welcoming uh, the person who specifically is in a difficult situation? I mean, if it was a case of the parish, for example, do you think... It becoming um, a point from the pulpit that we need to be a welcoming community in in a very concrete way. And how can this be made possible? It's a slow process. Um, We have to work at it. We have to pray about it. It's a process. It's going to take time. Um, We need to speak about it. Speak, communicate, share your stories. Yeah. 
but it will take time, you know, especially in this culture and especially with the media um, not being on our side. Um, it, it will take time. Um, we have to remember that the war was won on Calvary. We fight the battles here for whatever reason we're called to fight, but we have to remember that ultimately good triumphs over evil and to keep that in mind always. Okay, going back then, Sister Marianne says, how do we counter mantras like my body, my choice, and women's reproductive health? Well, I always say that a pro-life is, you know, it, it's my body. Yes, it is my body. But it's interesting to me that um, pro-choice actually has a very limited view of that. I have a right to my body only when I get pregnant. Um, but pro-choice says the right to my body starts when I actually get my body. So I got my body at conception. And I had a right to my body from the moment of conception. Um, so the question is, when, the, when, if you hear this, I have a right to my body, well, when do you get that right? Um, do you get it when, you know, I got, you know, the guarantee on my refrigerator came when I got my refrigerator. <laughs> uh, the right to my body comes when I get my body. So your, your right to your body came when you got your body. Um, the child in my womb, that body is not my body. If I'm carrying a little boy, he has a penis, and I don't, I assure you. Um, so, you know, the right to your body, you know, this is a different body. This has a different, D, you know, DNA. This has a different chromosomes than you do. This, this child is totally and independently different than you are. Um, could be a different sex, different eye color, different fingerprints, uh, different heartbeat. Um, so yes, you have a right to your body. Um, but not to somebody else's body, and your right to your body begins when you get it. Um, the concept of reproductive rights is just, uh, is, is very clever, very clever. The children of darkness are cleverer than the children of light. Reproductive rights. We don't have reproductive rights. You don't have a right to have a child in the first place. The concept of, you know, that's involved with in vitro fertilization also, this idea that child, another person is a right. Um, that I have a right right to have a child as if I have a like I have a right to have a car. Again, it's this idea of children as property, um, which they are not. Um, they are persons. And 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 learning to understand that takes apparently um that understanding is, is clouded with our uh, our fallen nature. Um, but other people or other persons are not property and they are not my rights. Um but that concept is, is extremely, has really taken root in this culture of death. And again, will be one of those things that will take time to uproot. What ways would you recommend for helping a pregnant woman see or understand the reality of the child in her womb? Well, certainly the ultrasounds help. Um, the, you know, prenatal life information, photographs that we now have that we've had for many years of what the baby looks like, facts about the child in the womb, um, understanding the difference between being a person and functioning as a person, which is on some level philosophical, but um, given that, you know, this is the information that's out there, that it's not a person yet because it doesn't function as a person, it's important um, again, to make clear that, you know, your coffee cup, a stone, a flower will never become a person because it doesn't have the being of a person. But this little guy in your womb um, who will function as a person in, um, pretty, pretty well within 20 weeks or less even feels pain um, by 19 or 20 weeks is a person already before it functions as a person. And then, you know, loving somebody, um, caring about them, showing that you would welcome this baby. Um, we had one young woman who came to the office and um, the advisor called me the next day and she said, I did everything wrong. Everything you taught me to do, I did wrong in the office. I started crying. I hugged the woman. I turned to the little child she had with her and said, wouldn't you like a little baby brother or sister? 
Um, she said, by the time the woman left, she said, thank you, um, you know, for caring and for crying, but I can't, I can't carry this pregnancy. I, I have to have an abortion. I just can't have another baby at this time. Um, we found out a year later when that woman came back that when she got home, um, she thought to herself, oh my Lord, how can I have an abortion when a stranger is crying for my child? A stranger is crying for my child. And uh, she, she didn't have the abortion and she later came back with that baby um, to see that advisor um, who had just loved her, who had just simply loved her and loved the child and showed that love by, by crying in the office um, and hugging the woman and doing, quote, everything wrong, um, turned out to be God's way of, of saving that woman and her child and that whole family. Um, you know, little things like the little stuffed animals and the baby clothes and, you know, anything, you know, we're, we are material beings, we're spiritual beings, but we're material beings, theology of the body, um, love people, hug them, tell them you're going to be okay. I mean, the first thing I did with my daughter was run up the stairs and throw my arms around her and say, it's going to be all right. I love you. Um, so showing our love to people and showing our love for this little, you know, pre-born tiny little person showing that right away. Um, is important. Vincent says, what would you suggest to a priest as a preacher? Uh, know the issue to begin with. Uh, I highly recommend my book, Understanding Abortion, um, because it has all the arguments in it. Um, <clears throat> all the pro-choice arguments, all the pro-life arguments, as does the seminar. Uh, the book has more arguments than the seminar. Uh, know the issue inside out. Um, reach out to families. Reach out to young people. Um, have programs in your parish um, about prenatal life, about abortion. Um, don't be silent about it. Um, be very, very gentle. I, in my book, hom my homiletics book, um, Home for the Homily, I talk about um, mentioning abortion and homily and that you have to be very careful and very gentle if if and when you do mention it you can be more open when it's a pro-life mass um, but in general we have to be very mindful that many many of parishioners have had abortions or been involved in in, in abortion um, and then we want to never mention abortion without mentioning the the possibility of reconciliation um, and forgiveness um, and healing um, so we, we have to understand that it's, it's a, you know, deeply painful issue for many people. So you don't want to spring it on people at mass, um, when they're there for healing and, and, you know, the Eucharist, um, and have moved on with their lives, um, hopefully. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to be silent about it. So you want to have, you want to have programs in your parish that address pregnancy, miscarriage, abortion, um, prenatal life. Um, and that that um, and that you're up to date on on the issue. Um, yeah, hope that helps. <laughs> yes, there's also um, as you touched upon the the very sensitivity of having had an abortion. And Elaine's question is, what does a woman who has had an abortion? Is she shown the body of the baby that has been removed? Um, usually not. Um, I do know of abortions in the past, especially with saline abortions um, back in the 70s, where the woman usually did see the baby um, because she went through labor, late-term saline abortions. Um, I've heard horror stories of women realizing it was a baby and trying to push the baby back in. Um, I, I am good friends with a nurse who at that time in her life assisted with, with these abortions and the nightmares um, that ensued. Um, but no, normally um, with abortion, you don't see it. With a miscarriage, I had a friend who had a miscarriage and, and I had to sort of go to the rescue and had to fish the little guy out of the toilet. It was, it was very, very sad. Um, but um, no, with, with abortion, all of that is hidden and, and 
and hidden to allow the um, the, the the delusion to continue that it was just a blob of cells. So, yeah, they wanted just it was just a blob. There was nothing there. There was no little hands and little feet and little heart beating. Um, it's just a blob. So no, they do not show you the the quote, product of conception. It <laughs> looks like a baby. Which again uh, confirms the impression of hiding the reality of what actually is occurring. That perhaps they haven't been very well informed in the first place. Perhaps there was no ultrasound. You know, perhaps there was no real discussion about uh, how old the child was. So, is there a way to um, address the abortion industry? Do you think with the reality that they're actually advocating can they be held to account to give a more honest account of what it is they're doing you have to understand that abortion is big money abortion is like the drug industry i mean we're talking about a big money industry deeply tied to the pornography industry i mean dr carol everett when she she you know ran the biggest abortion clinic in texas and later became pro-life um, and she testifies to the fact that um, after a woman had her first abortion, they would put her on a very low level of the pill so that she would get pregnant again and come back as a repeat customer. Um, so we're talking about a deeply, deeply evil industry. So we, we, that's huge money, um, often, you know, um, receives cash. Not People don't put their abortion on their credit cards so that their husband or their parents can see it. Um, so it's a cash industry. It's a huge cash cow industry. Um, so we're talking money, big, big money tied to the pornography industry. So no, this is not an industry that's about to become honest anytime soon. This is, we're, we're talking about a deeply, deeply evil business. Um, not one in the business of helping women, um, you know. So, I mean, an abortion, it's the, a late-term abortion can be thousands of dollars, and it's all cash. There's no records. And there's no, um, there's been no need for um, accountability. They don't, most abortion clinics don't even have to keep records. They're, this This industry is heavily protected. Um, by the culture of death. Um, so no, I don't see that happening anytime soon. In the in thinking about that, I was thinking about Nielsen, who was a doctor who committed innumerable abortions. <coughs> At a certain point, it struck him that the heart of the child that he was holding was a living heart. And he ceased it. In one sense, there is a work of compassion for people in the abortion industry. Do you have any way of helping that to be addressed? I remember reading one interview with an abortionist who said um, he did late term abortions and he said he didn't like doing late term abortions. Um, but he still felt a woman had a right to them. And so he had to pretend that the baby was an airplane that he was taking apart. Um, and that was how he kept himself able to do it until I believe it was his eight or nine year old child died on a bicycle accident. Um, and then he could no longer, um, I believe he stopped performing abortions. Um, I, I think conversion is always very personal <laughs> one to one i don't think you can convert the whole industry so to speak it's, it's always a one conversion and transformation in in christ or certainly in, in some form of goodness is is a personal thing um so i think people have to be reached one by one um, when i went to the life and choice conference at princeton in, in 2010 as i mentioned um it was helpful for me to realize that these people in this industry were persons themselves. Um, it gave me the opportunity to see that um, and to have 
certainly not, compassion for them, not compassion for what they did, but compassion for them and an, an understanding of the need for um, individual transformation. So it's a, it's a share your stories again, share them with doctors, share them with people that you know, um, in hopes of slowly um, reaching some of these people that persist in this evil. One of the general post row concerns is, uh, will it impact positively on frozen embryos in the sense that the uh, in vitro fertilization industry will see that there is a legal impact if these frozen embryos die? What do you think about this aspect of the implications of after row? Well, I certainly hope so. Um, the whole in vitro industry is, is, has its own whole list of horrors and sadness. Um, you know, one or two babies may be conceived and, and, and born, but the other, you know, 20 in the petri dish are frozen or thrown down the drain. Um, they are considered, you know, then there's the question of whose property are they, who do they belong to. Um, I know of a situation where, you know, a couple have been implanted, but one or two are still frozen. Um, and will, you know, what will become of them? So I, I do hope that this decision starts to put the brakes on this other um, related nightmare. It's, you know, it's closely related to the abortion issue. Um, very closely, because while these babies aren't quote unquote being aborted, they're being frozen and forever or, you know, thrown out. Um, so just murdered in a different way in a different place. Um, so yeah, I do hope it has an effect on that industry as well. And again, this idea that you have a right to have a child um, is, is a bizarre idea. You have a right to. You have a right to have a car, maybe you have a right to clean water, you have a right to food, but you don't have a right to have another person. That's a privilege, um, but not a right. Thinking back to an earlier comment you made about the theology of the body, one of the principal starting points for Pope John Paul II was the theology of gift. In in a way, that could be... Uh, a way of opening, whether in the parish as a priest or as a deacon, uh, this emphasis on the child as gift. What do you think? Yeah, we are we are gifts. Yes, <laughs> um, yeah. It's a certainly much more wholesome, healthy way of looking at persons um, than um, as rights or as as property. Um, yeah. So we are a gift to one another, but we are not. We are not. Um, we're not owned by one another, or bought. And and you know, in vitro, it's basically you're buying, buying and selling um, body parts. You're buying and selling sperm and egg, um, and um, so the so the body becomes a commodity rather than, as you're saying, gift. Yeah. In terms of. Um gospel passages, I was thinking about the woman caught in adultery. and It's always struck me there was no mention of the man. Again, this is a possible opportunity for the hidden man, the hidden father, to be, in a way, addressed. Do you think that is, would be helpful? We certainly have to bring men into this discussion. Um, you know, abortion is seen as a women a woman's issue. Um, obviously, it's not just a woman's issue. It's a man's issue. It's a family issue. It's um, the culture's issue. Um, certainly, the church's issue. Um, parishes need to be involved. But yes, we have to start realizing that women do not get pregnant all by themselves, um, that we're talking about relationships. Um, very often, um, abortion is a result of failed you know, as a result of failed contraception, and, and that's a whole nother issue um, that needs to be better understood, um, that um, this is another evil that um, isn't understood as an evil, 
<laughs> so, um, you know, um, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so we absolutely have to bring men into the discussion. Uh, we have, you know, half the people being aborted are baby boys. Um, so they are part certainly at that level of the discussion, and that's often ignored also. Um, you know, I, I know many men in, in the pro-life community who have been told, you know, you have no right to speak about this whatsoever. You're a man. What do you know? Like, who do you think you are? It's like, wait a minute. <laughs> baby boys get aborted and men are part of the, the sexual equation of creating babies. So, um, yes, we have to start to realize this is not a woman's issue. This is a human issue. Um, it's a moral issue. It's a human issue that the whole human community is involved in. In terms of your counselling, uh, could you elaborate on the connection or the pathway almost between contraception and abortion? <laughs> well, you know, most, many of the women, they sort of fall into two categories. One is the woman who doesn't want to use contraception because somehow she realizes that, you know, that makes sex premeditated um, outside of marriage and, and she doesn't want to be that person. So she hasn't used contraception and just kind of hope for the best and now finds herself pregnant. Um, the second is the person more often who has used contraception and it's failed. Um, so you're relying on something that's, that's not a good to begin with. And now the not good is in some sense failed. Um, uh, and as I said, the abortion clinics will often, you know, put a woman back on a, an unreliable contraceptive to make more money with abortion down the line. Um, you know, that, that the contraceptive issue is, is a bigger issue that's a little bit would take more time to go into um, more clearly why it's an evil you know, than we have, I think, right now. But we might do a conference on that eventually. Well, thank you for your um, forthright and honest and often homely uh, talk and answers to questions. So now we we'll return to Sebastian. All right. Thank you, Francis, for your uh, moderation of this uh, Q&A period. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating. Sister Marie Louise Pullman, who is... Um, a sister of St. Francis of Penance in Christian Charity, will offer our closing prayer. Uh, sister Marie Louise, she's having some problems with her audio. So we'll give her a second to see if she can connect. All right, I'll read her closing prayer. She provided it to us. And thank you, Sister Marie Louise, for, uh, for putting this prayer together for us. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Lord God, as you are the giver of the mystery of life, we recognize that we have no right to take it away. For you created human life out of love for your son, whom you sent to show us how to live. Jesus healed the sick, fed the hungry, paid his taxes, changed water into wine so the bridegroom could celebrate with a larger than expected number of guests. Jesus forgave the thief who was crucified next to him. Raised from the dead, an only son of a widow, as well as Lazarus, the brother of Martha and Mary. Lord, help us to find ways to assist those women who are faced with the challenge of an unplanned pregnancy. Give us the wisdom of offering emotional support, practical options like adoption, or even suggestions of agencies that have moral options. Holy Spirit, we ask you to provide us with your wisdom that we may honor and share your love with all we meet. Glory be to the Father who created us, the Son who redeemed us, and the Holy Spirit who provided us with creative ways of appreciating life in all its forms. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Hello, God's beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in 
and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes place.